All right, let's do this. All right, questions coming in. So first one is from my good friend, No Name, from Parts Unknown, still confused on transverse frontal plane. So this is something you may need to come in early uh, to work on, okay? So, because obviously you have got to understand perspectives and planes to apply it to the human body and motions. So, um, sagittal. But if I look like this now, I don't see sagittal anymore. I see frontal. Frontal. I see frontal. But if I look like this now, it's sagittal. So, um, it's all about the spin and it's all about who's seeing the spin. The room always sees the same spin. The room will see transverse, no matter how I might see it. It's transverse, room frontal, room sagittal. But my eyes, the planes move with my eyes and the same for the joints. So the elbow only moves in its sagittal plane, no matter how I might move it globally it's still the same locally from the elbow's perspective. So um, again, if you're still not understanding that, let's just be patient, but start coming in early or, uh, or arranging time so we can work on it. Uh, so that way uh, we can take care of that. I'm still confused. This is another one uh, from my friend, uh, no name. I'm still confused on right and left transverse pelvic girdle rotation. Very understandable. Okay, this is kind of weird, right? You typically think of joint motions as just elbow, wrist, and so there's some different perspectives uh, from different parts of the body. So the key thing is, is that for the pelvis, right? Ilium, ischium, pubis, uh, also uh, where it attaches to the ilium, these are, these are fused, nice, solid, rigid base, remember from the skyscraper that we were on. So this functions as a block. We can't move it independently like we do our scapula can't take the left and do stuff and the right and do stuff. So they all move together. I use the example of like a bowl or a chalice uh, where you can look at it as pouring water out the front, back, the right side, the left side. Transverse is spinning like this. So imagine like your head spinning in its transverse plane, looking to the right, looking to the left. It's the same thing with the pelvis. You imagine a couple eyes here, pelvis looking to the right, looking to the left, pelvic girdle rotations in its transverse plane. Uh, we're going to have right and left transverse. Remember, right and left means two different things in two different dimensions. Right, left spin, transverse, right, left lateral, cartwheel to the right, cartwheel to the left, pour water out the right, pour water out the left, spin to the right, spin to the left. So we have to communicate. Um, remember what I taught you guys about joint motion, side joint motion. Uh, right knee flexion. It's similar where when we have frontal versus transverse, we have to give a side of spin, spinning to the right, spinning to the left. And then we have to communicate which plane it's spinning in. So we'll say right lateral if we're talking about the frontal and right transverse if we're talking about transverse, okay? So those are pelvic girdle rotations. Um, so far, I've taught you guys how the pelvis can spin about the hips, right? So if you imagine this is my pelvis, like in the, in the skeleton, my buddy right here, pelvis looking to the right, right transverse, left transverse, and that motion is gonna be when I'm standing um, because of internal and external rotation. I can rotate the pelvis in different positions. We did that at the end of class. Um, but just remember, if you ask an eight-year-old child to spin to the right or spin to the left, when they spin to the right, they're probably gonna follow their right hand, spin to the left, follow their left hand. So the pelvis follows those same rules. Hey, pelvis, spin to your right. Pelvis is gonna follow the right side. Hey, pelvis, spin to the left. It's gonna follow the left side, right, left. Transverse pelvic rotation. Okay, I got a, a great question. Uh, here asking about hip, ab, and adduction. So hip, ab, and adduction uh, in anatomical can only occur in the frontal plane coming away from six o'clock. Then once you get out, then you can move in the pelvis's transverse plane to do that variation of ab and adduction, the horizontal ab and abduction. 
Hip avenue adduction is confusing only because of the names that sound very close together. I told you guys that in class, ab and adduction sound similar, so they're easily uh, confused. That's why I use the terms AB and AD just to re-emphasize those one little flippy letters that make matter or ad -da 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 or ab -ab 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 -ab. do silly things like that to emphasize it. So the way I taught you guys in class is, is that in anatomical position, imagine your femurs as clock hands that are pointing six o'clock on the clock, right? And so what we're gonna do is, is we're gonna imagine an open chain when my feet are off the ground, that away from six o'clock is gonna be ab, towards six o'clock is gonna be ad. Let's see if I can get up here. Right? If I fall off and hurt myself, tell my family that I love them. So ab, ba 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 ba, ad, da 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 da, ab, ba 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 ba, ad, da da da, away from six, towards six. Remember, it's all about the rotation. It's not literally the six because um, I could continue to adduct. Ab, ba 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 ba, ba ad, da 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 da. So if I continue to rotate this way, eventually I could get past six, but it's the same rotation as the adduction. Uh, so remember, it's about direction of spin, not necessarily liter literal fixed marks, but I just use that six o'clock as a reference from anatomical to say away in anatomical is gonna be ABBA, and then back towards uh, anatomical is gonna be ADDA. So abs and ads, and then we talk about a variation of ab and ad in the trunk when we're talking about the shoulders, or the pelvis when we're talking about the hips. A horizontal AB and AD duction, horizontal AB and adduction, which follow the same rules. In class, I taught you that if you're just taking the clock and you're laying it down and you're still looking at the clock hand going towards or away from six. So I'm going to use my shoulder as an example. Away, towards, away, towards. If I do this, away, towards, away, towards, away, towards, away, towards. So the variation of ab and adduction still follows the same rules. Uh, the reason we give it a variation name is because there are gonna be some different muscles that are pulling in the trunk and or pelvis is transverse plane versus the trunk or pelvis is frontal plane. Some of them are the same, but some of them are different. So um, because this is different <laughs> than this enough, uh, that's why we give it um, a variational name. You can't travel in that road in anatomical position. In anatomical position, my three planes allow me to flex, extend, add, add, internal, external, rotate. I have to actually reposition myself to get to this new road. Well, now transverse plane means this. Sagittal plane means internal and external rotation. Um, so that's kind of, and then frontal plane is just going back. Back home. So uh, I hope that helps clarify your super awesome question. Okay, explain, explain the last trick example you gave in glass. Explain transverse frontal sagittal trick question, trick example. Um, the word trick, let's talk, let's first start there. Tricky is a function of understanding. Now, I haven't done my job in teaching you guys developing understanding yet, so that's why these questions are kind of tricky now, right? But as we practice and as you guys study, then it's not gonna be tricky anymore. It's just gonna be common knowledge. You know, you guys don't get tricked reciting your alphabet because you know it well enough and you know it safe. So I just want to be positive that questions aren't tricky if you know what, um, if you know the material, okay? So the last question we did was a variation of horizontal AB and A deduction. So again, I'm gonna use shoulder and then we'll get to the hip because it's the same classification point. From my shoulder's perspective, this is the exact same motion as this. If I froze it, 
and rotate it flat, back globally, you'd see I'm in the same in position for my shoulder joint. From here to there is just as much right shoulder horizontal abduction as if I kept this fixed and rotated my socket this way, okay? So that's the first thing to remember. And it follows the same patterns we've been doing in other joints of the body, right? This one moved, this one fixed, this is the same motions as this. So for the pelvis, what we did is, let's see if I can get a little extra rotation going. So what we did for the pelvis is, is I, let's see, Brian, just gotta adapt a little bit. Let's adapt. Let's see if that works. Okay, yay. All right, so I did as we say, right hip ab is the exact same as right hip ab. Might look different, but it's the same. This is the same as that, okay? We did things like this is the same as this. Okay, precedent. So now what I'm doing is I'm repositioning my hip. I'm in a flexed position and I'm showing you that this is the exact same as this. From here to there is just as much right hip horizontal abduction as from here to there. Now, I can't literally do it like I did with my shoulder because since my right leg is on the ground, if I attempted to lift it out, I'd fall to the ground and friction's preventing it from happening anyway. So that's why I have to come back up and show you that this is the same as that, okay? So that was the trick. Uh, explain transverse frontal and sagittal. Uh, Transverse frontal and sagittal are three different rotational dimensions, 3D of rotational motion. And in the linear world, we call them X, Y, Z, up, down, left, right, front, back. In rotational world, we call them sagittal frontal and transverse spin. It's first test stuff. We gotta stick to next test stuff. Can you give a few more examples of pelvic rotations? Absolutely. Although I don't know if they're gonna be different. Right lateral left lateral, anterior, posterior, right transverse, left transverse, okay. Um, guys, a lot of people not understanding planes and axes. That's first test stuff. So my point is, is that we gotta, we gotta maybe, um, come in the class early or come in early so that we can work on this stuff, okay? Knee movement, good stuff. It looks like it's moving and it is. Hip external internal rotation, okay? So for the knee, it looks like it's moving and it is. Right knee, extension right knee flexion. It looks like it's not moving, but it is moving. That's kind of tough for the knee. Um, but I guess maybe if somebody was just looking at the lower leg, right? If you did like a, um, a Smith machine squat where the femur is moving about the tibia, so you get this action going, you know, maybe someone might use. The knee's kind of hard to illusionize, except in transverse plane, right? For the rotation, that's, uh, that's, that's a much tougher question. So in open chain, we have uh, internal, external, internal, external, internal, external, internal, external. And then when we fix our foot on the ground and we plant and cut, that's external. This is internal, external, internal. 
So, do the hip and the pelvis always move together? Or are there exceptions? Oh yeah. Um, although we rotate our pelvis commonly because of hip motion, as I uh, hinted in class, we don't have to if our um, feet are off the ground. So like when we're hanging from a bar or a Roman chair, then the pelvic girdle spins, whether you look at it as literal spinning or pouring water out is going to be because of trunk motion. So uh, your hips do not have to rotate the pelvis. You can rotate the pelvis. In class I used uh, the examples of you can spin the basketball with your hands under the ball. Or you have big hands, you can palm it at the top and rotate the pelvis off the top. This represents trunk. So if you're hanging from a bar, you can still twist your pelvis. You can still pour water out the front and back, side to side. Uh, and that is because of trunk motion, okay? So, those are all of your clarification questions. I'm gonna back this up a little bit so that we can kind of review. Um, let me see. Again, adapt, improvise, overcome. Let's see if I can tilt this a little bit, a little better angle go down a little bit. This is like Cloverfield. Hope nobody's getting sick. All right. So what I'll do is I'll do a review of all the different motions you guys are going to be accountable for. Uh, so far, we have right ankle plantar, right ankle dorsi. Okay. We have left subtalar inversion, left subtalar eversion. flexion and knee extension specifically this was left knee flexion left knee extension of course you could have bilateral bilateral for the hip oh, sorry back to the knee you can have external rotation and internal rotation remember the foot might move but the point is is that the knee rotates okay so whatever is happening at my foot that's a foot thing that's a subtalar thing or ankle thing Specifically, though, to reposition the whole, me rotating my knee like this. Remember, the reason we have that is to give a little bit when we cut and plant. If uh, it didn't give, uh, we'd snap it off. Okay, what else we got for our hip? Uh, oh, and uh, ankle is uni uniaxial hinge, only allows motion in one plane. Uh, subtalar joint is a gliding joint, mostly from. Knee is modified hinge. It's modified, so it's mostly hinge, mostly like your digits or your elbow, but because it allows that rotation when the knee is flexed, that's what just makes it different. Hip, ball and socket, sagittal, we're looking flexion extension. Frontal, we're looking ab and add. Transverse, we're looking external, internal. The hip has a variation of ab and add away from six, but when I flex, I can also go away from six. So we call that horizontal AD and adduction. From the perspective of my pelvis, my pelvis can spin forward, anterior. My pelvis can spin back, posterior. My pelvis can spin to its right, right lateral. My pelvis can spin to its left, left right, lateral. My pelvis can look to its right, right transverse. My pelvis can look to its left, left transverse. All of those pelvic girdle rotations when my feet are on the ground are gonna spin because of hip motion. So the anterior pelvic girdle rotation when my feet are on, is on the ground, it's gonna be because of bilateral hip flexion. The posterior because of bilateral hip extension. The right lateral because of left hip add and right hip ab. The left lateral because of left hip ab, right hip add. The right transverse because of right hip internal, left hip external. Remember my feet, my toes are pointing towards the camera. So when I do this, my right hip is internally rotated relative to the socket. And my left hip is externally rotated. This is how my toes are pointing, right? So if my pelvis is here, the hips had to do this to maintain that position. 
right hip internal, left hip external. Maybe that example can help someone. Left transverse because of left hip internal, right hip external. Remember my feet are still pointing this way. For them to go back home, I'd have to externally rotate my left and I'd have to internally rotate my right. So to leave home, they had to do this. Okay. All right, let's see. Remember I could do it just on one leg. I could have right lateral because of just right hip ab. But this leg came up off the ground. Same thing with transverse. I could do it on one leg or the other. Okay. So let's do a quick rundown on the joints that I just talked about. Okay, so your ankle joint, your talocrural joint. Okay, so that's the one that allows motion in the sagittal plane. There's a good view of that talus in that socket. So you can see from this image, you know, that talus isn't allowed to spin. It's not allowed to do this. And the way it's fit in that socket, it's not allowed to do that. The only way it's allowed to rotate is in that sagittal plane like a clock. And then you see all of those uh, small little grindy tarsal bones, right? Really efficient at dissipating force and summating motion. So what lives under the talus, that calcaneus, subtalar, so the glide you get with the calcaneus and all the little tarsal bones, the cuboid and the navicular and the cuneiform, okay? So that's the little gliding thing. Also, your metatarsals glide um, so subtalar transverse tarsal joints are going to be our inversion eversion. That talocrural joint, that hinge ankle joint is what's going to be plantar and dorsi. Then we get to our knee. Okay. Our modified hinge. Ugh. This thing doesn't really allow good motion. So the hinge part. About a bilateral axis. Same thing with the ankle, bilateral axis, right? So there's our malleoli, it kind of represents our bilateral axis. So rotation in the sagittal plane about the bilateral axis. Same thing for our knee in the sagittal plane. Knee flexion and extension is going to occur about its bilateral axis. And then the internal and external rotation when the knee is flexed, right? When the knee is bent or flexed, the internal and external rotation is going to be from the polar axis, specifically from the tibia's perspective, the long axis of the tibia, okay? Modified hinge joint. The knee joint is articulated with the femur and the tibia, okay? The ankle joint is articulated with the talus, distal tibia, and fibula. So the fibula and the tibia form the socket and the talus forms um, uh, the convexity uh, that fits inside the concavity. Hip joint, ball and socket. What are the bones that articulate it? The femur, and then the three bones that connect uh, synarthrotically uh, to form the socket, the ilium, ischium, and the pubis. Let me move the hand right there so you guys can see it. So with a ball and socket concept, it can move in all three dimensions, sagittal, frontal, and transverse. Sagittal stuff, we're talking flexion and extension. Frontal stuff, we're talking ab and adduction. Um, the screws in here won't allow it uh, a little bit. Internal, external rotation uh, for transverse, okay? So, moving forward, what I'm gonna teach you guys is that the shoulder is the same exact kind of joint as the hip. Same exact classification, okay? So it's gonna allow sagittal, frontal, and transverse. In terms of uh, bony articulation, we're looking at humerus and scapula. Uh, the glenoid fossa of the scapula is the socket, okay? Sagittal, frontal, transverse. So all the motions are gonna be the same, fetal, out of fetal, away from six, towards six, spin medially, spin laterally. 
The elbow is the upper extremity's equivalency of the knee, except it's not a modified hinge, it's a true hinge. So all you can do is flex and extend. It's articulated with the humerus and the ulna. This little guy right here, that's called the radial ulna joint. And that is super important for our upper extremity function uh, to reposition our hands um, for what I call a functional circle of grip where we need to be able to position our dexterous hands in a endless bubble of function. And our radial ulna joint helps to reposition our hands and we need to get them in different positions. Uh, basically, the radius is uh, either wrapping itself around the ulna, unwrapping itself around the ulna. And because the corporal bones are uh, permanently attached in the transverse plane uh, to the radius and ulna, when you wrap the radius, the whole hand goes along for the ride because it's connected that way in the, in the transverse plane, okay? So radial ulna joint is literally just how the radius wraps and unwraps around the ulna. So this could kind of be confusing because you think about, oh man, isn't this part of the elbow? Well, it lives in the same apartment complex, but it's really the ulna that is articulating with the humerus and then the radius is just wrapping, unwrapping, spinning like a clock um, about the ulna. That's why we call it the radial ulna joint, okay? Uh, one of the last joints I'm gonna teach you guys about is the wrist joint. Uh, it's a, a biaxial joint. It can rotate in the sagittal plane, get us in the fetal and out of fetal, and it can rotate in the frontal plane. I'm gonna teach you what those deviations are called. The main important thing I wanna hint to you guys now is that the wrist doesn't twist. The wrist doesn't move in its transverse plane. It looks like it does, but if you see my forearm moving, that's actually the radius wrapping and unwrapping about the ulna. Um, so the wrist doesn't twist. The, the, the hand can twist, you, know, you can globally twist, but the wrist joint itself doesn't spin in the transverse plane. It only moves uh, sagittal and frontal. Okay, and then finally, uh, I'm gonna teach you guys about scapula motion. So scapula is the upper extremity's version of the pelvis, but unlike the lower extremity where we need stability down here, uh, our scapula have independence. My right and my left can move independently uh, from each other, so we can actually have some shifting. I, I like to look at it as orbiting. The, the scapula can, if you look, if you think about like the heart as the sun, and the ribs as the orbit, the scapula can actually kind of orbit, can kind of orbit the ribs uh, forward and back, call it protraction, retraction. It could kind of orbit up and down. Uh, we call that elevation and depression. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna teach you how the scapula can help reposition the socket uh, to get your arms way up over your head. We call that upward rotation of the scapula. So, um, the intent was to talk about um, some clarification questions that you guys had. Some I can, some I can't. What I mean by that is I can't re-lecture stuff on, on, a, on a video uh, because I, I would really need for you guys that are still kind of confusing on planes and axes, uh, come, come in, come in early, let me help you. But that way I can really give better teaching because I can kind of get your feedback and kind of use different analogies. So if you're still struggling on planes and axes, uh, let's make it work, okay? Come in early or stay late or we'll arrange a time and uh, let me try to help you through that. Um, in addition, I did a, a review of every joint that I've given you so far in class, hold the count before. And I previewed, I didn't lecture on it, but I previewed what's coming uh, up the chain, okay? I got it up the chain, then down the chain. And then obviously I'm gonna lecture about cervical and trunk, but that's freaky. So I'm gonna wait and do that in person. I uh, just wanted to give you some um, analogies like uh, the lower extremities version of the ankle and subtalar joint is the wrist. And the, uh, I'm sorry, the upper extremity, and the upper extremities version of the knee joint is the elbow and radial ulna, and the upper extremities version of the hip is the shoulder. And, uh, the upper extremities version of the pelvis is the scapula, some stuff that you guys uh, would kind of be more comfortable getting introduced to. And then uh, we'll talk about the spine uh, at the end. So 
That being said, if you guys have any questions, email me. I'm going to be checking my email. And if we have to chat, we can arrange a time to, for me to call you or you to call me, and I can clarify some things. If you guys are studying during the break, uh, I understand it's Mardi Gras time. Uh, but remember, man, little bites of the apple. Stay up on this. In addition, remember, you can be practicing this stuff at all times uh, as long as you're awake. Uh, maybe sometimes you think about it when you're sleeping too. But you could be analyzing people's motion or your motion at all times in terms of you know, walking, jogging, exercising. People watching is a great way to, uh, don't get in trouble for it, but it's a great way to practice these motions, these planes, and these concepts. Okay? So I hope you guys have a great break. Be safe, and uh, we'll see you next Friday.